Would you write a check to the fishers in the Caribbean? Yes. Should the government have more business to back in a check? No. Well, the check has significantly improved the revenue from the Caribbean, particularly in Trinidad. Okay, it's in all those places. And evidence of this relates to the number of visitors to the Caribbean. Evidence of this relates to the number of visitors to the that expedition. Now, in 2009, Barbados is not just under 27,000 visitors in Trinidad. And in 2010, it just rose by the five country. But by the end of 2011, the number grew to 36,823. So, thanks to Red Jet started at 26 to be trained out in May 2011, we got over 8,000 more visitors in Trinidad. And that did not happen because of Caribbean Airlines. It happened because of Red Jet. So, that's the big bonus to Barbados. These people came to Barbados, they had to look for accommodation, they had to buy food, they had to pay for, for taxis, they, they took the bus. Now, my assertion is that the government of Barbados should not use taxpayers' money to support an airline which was conceptualized and brought into reality with a flawed business plan. Firstly, rejecting to the marketplace so they were required both Caribbean airlines and the app receive financial support from their shareholder government, government in the case of the app. They knew the risk they were taking. Secondly, the Caribbean market is not as conducive to the low-cost model of air travel as the European market is. The Caribbean market is much smaller and the routes are too thin to support the traditional low-cost model. Moreover, RegJet simply cannot copy the success of these jet or an air in Europe in the Caribbean with their current approach. Now thirdly, let us not forget the government of Barbados is already a major shareholder in Riyadh. And Riyadh is still, still incurred heavy losses annually and is fairly inefficient. Why should the government of Barbados now also face itself with the burden of supporting a new airline in the face of RegJet? The air transport industry is one of the most difficult and predictable businesses in the world. Imagine an industry that is susceptible to everything else is done. Volcanic ash, hurricanes, government regulations, unfair taxes, terrorism, high oil prices, etc. All of these are issues which are largely outside the control of today's airline managers. But yes, they have to do their utmost to limit the impact on the business which they manage. And I mean, does anybody remember an airline called Carib Express? Which operated between 94 and 96? I mean, one of the largest mistakes that they made with that airline is now also being made with Rajat. You utilize the incorrect aircraft. You simply cannot operate jet aircraft on short sectors, some as short as 25 minutes in the Lucia. Play the attitudes which are drawn to verbal props. I mean, it's economic money. Jet aircraft need to be able to fly between 30 and 40 thousand feet, cruise for maximum fuel efficiency, and then approach my name 20 minutes before they get to the destination. If you're going to take an MBA 2 flight from Barbados to Barbados and Barbados, Russia, which is only 23 minutes, how high can you go and how much fuel are you burning? I mean, they've gone around from the beginning. Caravan Express did the exact same thing. They brought British airspace 1460. Why would we need a four engine jet to get from Barbados to San Lucia? I mean, it's <coughs> No, any first domestic air transport shouldn't have told the investors in Regent, hey, you guys have gone for the wrong aircraft. <laughs> Liat operates 35 of the aircraft, you guys have gone for 140 MC. I know people who travel around Regent every month and they further go, oh yeah, my flight is solution has 35 people on it. The reality of the situation is that if you're going to come to low cost models, low cost airlines will make money by having high low factors, you need 85% plus. Look at these jet, look at right here. Constantly, every week, they achieve low factors between 85 and 95%. You've got to keep those things almost full. The other thing is that you need to do extremely quick turnovers, turnover times at the airport. You can't come into San Lucia at 4 o'clock and be up six. That's not how low low cost carriers make money. They make money by doing quick turnovers, keeping the planes in the air, using them 12 to 40 hours each day, not three to four. So there are lots of problems with red jet. And as I said, my opinion is the plan is flawed. Now, the only aircraft, the heard name is called, the aircraft which RegJet are using this year are now 25 years old. So you can imagine doing the initial which you will need, the amount of fuel which you will burn. Now the other thought is, the aircraft which we are using are being returned by American Airlines because American Airlines is no uh, replacement with new Boeing 737 So they don't want them, but RegJet is taking them because they're cheap. But cheap is not always good. 
And it was to me, I would have said to me, if I said to me, right, Jack, go for an ATR 72 600. Go for a Bombardier Dash AQ 400. Something which is more fuel efficient, something which uh, is a lot slower. It holds its speed at 75 passengers, just what you need to the Caribbean. We don't need 150 jet. So, the other thing that you're feeling in red jet is having no airline management expertise at the top. Aviation management is a site, and that's not the year of the experience on your disposal. You need to consult an expert in the field to make that possible decision. Just having a degree in business management doesn't make you a good airline manager. It's important. This is a very complicated topic. And suffice it to say, the fact alone that one of the leading best in Europe to run a very different company pulled up before season of view. The division block place before season of the predicament to begin with, because they were the ones who were supposed to provide the funding. Mm. Now, such a major bank with such a major asset pulled up, that should send a fair message. And I will stop there. That should send a very fair message. And as it pertains to you from the Caribbean airlines. Anyway, getting, right? fuel, getting discounts on, on, on bulk fuel and everything. Well, again, that is a decision for the Prime Minister of Trinidad and her civil aviation authority. If that's what you say, you Caribbean airlines, so be it. So right now, it's probably a lot more resources than more than it does. They can afford to have an airline. DWA was in came into inception, I think, in 1940. They've been doing this for almost a century. For a bit of it cannot use the mindset that but that's the way we've always done it. <laughs> no, I'm saying I'm saying what I'm saying is that Barbados does not have the resources set up to be full owner of an airline. It was introduced in nineteen ninety four at the rate of five pounds for any person travelling within the United Kingdom or the European Union. Or ten pounds for anyone travelling or studying from the European Union. And since then this tax has grown and increased exponentially to as high as one hundred and eighty four pounds as low as 13 pounds, depending on where you go. And there is no doubt that this tax is a truly inequitable with current structure and for several, and several reasons on which the main two are. The tax in its current form discriminates against persons traveling and cabin the service higher than the economy, and the tax also discriminates against persons who can afford to travel outside the European Union, and more specifically, to destinations 2,000 miles plus away from London. There is no doubt in my mind that the AP has had some following impact on Barbados, on Barbados, the tourism industry, and that of several other Caribbean islands. But in terms of Barbados, our impact has been most profound. And why? Barbados is significantly more dependent on visitors in the United Kingdom than any other destination in this part of the region. And evidence of this lies in the fact that we have, we have, or I should say, had about three times the amount of airlines from the United Kingdom and some other destinations in the Caribbean. As recently as the week ending March 24, 2012, which was the end of the major time table for European airlines, Barbados received 12 weekly flights from London on British Airways, seven weekly flights from Virgin Atlantic from London, and two weekly flights from Virgin as well from Manchester, and a little a charter service that was around the UK. And now that the summer time table has started last Sunday, British Airways has cut their 12 flights to Oregon at Delta 7. Virgin Atlantic has gone back to do a double job services at St. Lucia and I see that <coughs> The charter services is normal, they have disappeared until the next season. The British Airways loss is the most significant. We've now lost 1,200 seats a week, every week, until the week commenced in October 28th, 2012. And that's a major loss. But what is also important to know is where exactly this capacity has been redeployed to. They decided to send the same aircraft to Orlando instead. And wait. Now, Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States and is 3,677 miles from London. Therefore, Washington and any city within the United States falls into band B for how the AP is structured. Barbados, on the other hand, Bridgetown is 4,201 miles from London, so unfortunately we fall into band B, band C, I should say, which means that anyone traveling to Barbados will pay. More tax, more APD than someone going to the Now, to me, I'm the worst. Currently, as it stands, if a holiday maker is going to Orlando, they will pay £65 for a company ticket and £130 in any cabin above the economy. Should that same person come to Barbados, they have to pay £81 in the economy or £152 in any class above the economy. To me, it matters worse. Should that same holiday maker decide to go to Honolulu, the capital of Hawaii? 
which is almost 7,300 models who live in London. They will pay, still pay the last ACB and then they will come to Barbados on holiday. And that is tragic. Now the largest economic challenges to Barbados are growing flat are being seen decreases in our annual fiscal arrival to the United Kingdom every year since 2007, with the exception of 2011. In 2007, we welcomed 223,000 flight hundred and seven flight visitors in the UK. In 2008, this figure declined to 219,953. In 2009, it first declined to just 190,632. And it's important to know that 2009 was the same year when the geographical balance system was instituted by the British government. In 2010, we further declined to 181,000. And in 2011, we saw an increase to 189,000. So based on those official figures, Barbados has worked here to claim 42,000 visitors in the UK since 2007. So that's why he said earlier that yes, our trade ministry has been claimed. Because to lose 42,000 visitors from the UK is a drastic loss. Now in 2009 alone, we lost 29,000 visitors in the UK. While some of these claims can be attributed to the global economic crisis, which was ever present at that time, the disgraceful AP tax regime the British of the British Conservative Party must also share a significant portion of the blame. It's not as if British holidaymakers stopped playing for our fun. We have simply decided to go elsewhere. Destinations such as Ibiza and Barcelona in Spain, and East in France, Marrakesh in Morocco, and Orlando, for example. This is what we know how to cope with, and this is what we have to compete against. Having a reduction of 40,000 visitors for Barbados will mean that local suppliers will struggle to keep occupancy rates up. Restauranters will have to become more innovative and employ new strategies to stay afloat, and workers in the tourism industry will continue to find it difficult to work a full week, if at all. And I worked in the industry for six years as a reader, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Our one vibrant and gift source market, which wants to come for as much as 42% of our tourists, is now coming to just 33%. For those who can still afford to visit or it, it means that they would simply have to spend less money when they are right here. Thereby spending shorter periods, even though less, taking fewer excursions, at at and spending less on local rates and short periods. Well, I can see we definitely need to worry about this DPP. I'm going to ask you to answer one more question and then move to the audience and ask question. Is there anything that we can do to counter the higher passengers we at this particular time? In terms of countering the APD, uh, several global efforts will be made by regional government as well as Caribbean tourism organizations to lobby the British Conservative government against the APD tax. And what is clear to me and uh, has been clear to me since 2010 is that the British government has little interest in the impact of the APD on Barbados and ever smaller islands. In fact, the current chancellor, the exchequer, is on record as saying that the APD is a tax on the aliens, and although they are not legally obliged to, many choose to pass on this charge to the passenger in the form of a business charge. For convenience, this is usually done at the time of the ticket sale, although the tax itself is not due until the aircraft takes off. Whether or not you are able to look to pass on the latest rate increase is consequently a business decision and is outside the remit of her majesty's <coughs> customs and revenue of customs. So the statistics will get it to later when they come to speak on the APD. But in terms of how it's going to affect us, our tourism is cheap to receive to when we go. Our unemployment levels will continue to raise. And the main problem for us at the moment is that there are a lot of visitors, a lot of potential visitors abroad who don't think that they're going to get good value for money by coming to Borgetis. And every day on the we need to at least see how certain themselves in Borgetis are basically discounting their rooms just to get people to come to Borgetis. I think it's quite unfortunate. There is one popular hotel here which is currently giving 25% off if you book five nights. And this is a five star hotel in Barbados. And when you get, when you do things like that, it leads to desperation. Which really shouldn't be the case. There are a lot of tourists abroad who will choose to go to St. Lucia over Barbados every day because they think that they get, they perceive that they get better value for money. The hotel rates are lower, the taxes are still same, the same hotels are also lower, and food costs are also lower. So when they look at Barbados, they say to themselves, why should they spend an additional 500 pounds to come to Barbados on holiday if they can go to St. Lucia instead for the same year here? And this is something that we have to address at the government level. 
Yeah, I want to agree with my the fellow founders. Um, the thing is, we know that there is a lot of these Obviously, there's a recession going on in the world, there's some financial issues, so as I said, as I said, there's a lot of products. If you don't have the, the disposal you can spend on it, then you just can't afford it. So what we need to do is, I am not, I agree, that one of the things we're going to say, we can print the accounts, what we currently have, we also need to look at diversification in the market. So I made a few notes here, because obviously it's down, but everything goes through a cycle, and you have, you have to get rejuvenation stage now. So we have to really look at sports stories and not have these one-off concentrated events. Then we have to really and truly look at how we want to develop the sports product of our bills. We have a wonderful um, uh, attendance and a great piece of um, real estate. But what are we doing with the real estate? I've seen it through cricket matches and having, you know, some bets. I mean, the bets aren't bad and I love the whole spot. But really, truly, are we really maximizing on the potential that this game is noble? Then we have to look at having authentic Barbadian experiences as part of the product. I don't think someone wants to travel to Barbados and see what they see in London or see in New York or wherever they want to take We want to have authentic experiences and I won't be surprised that persons from a quote unquote higher economic bracket would actually enjoy and would pay to experience something authentic as opposed to the makeup that we put on. When we first and the accent, when we first come here. And then you probably say that we can tell about the box and things like the box. And you may not want to say it, but I want to throw two controversial things over there. We might have to look at the Dino as a part of the tourism product. I mean, I probably want to get some links for this come Monday, but it's something we have to look at. Um, Bermuda is currently looking at if they're going to have the Dino as part of the product. And if you're concerned, is a what's going to happen to the local, et cetera, et cetera, bar local from going into the Dino. What we need to do is we have to seriously look at the our product, and that is the way to diversify. And then, the next controversial uh, thing would be four seasons. Everything that we are saying, I think we all agree that we need to keep attracting a certain type of clientele, one who is not going to be affected as much by the quote unquote recession and financial crisis. We have to have some place to put them beside the necessary standing lane. And therefore, we would, as a people, need to get behind the four seasons project and hope for the best. Who knows, maybe it will be a point where we can actually invest our own funds in a project like four seasons. And you know, we don't want to invest on culture in Barbados, but I think that that's something that we, we definitely need to look at. If it is that we're saying that tourism is our business, we all want to play our part. And then you would be concerned that the government would make an investment uh, through the national insurance scheme in the four seasons. How serious are we as a people of tourism on this? Crap, shred every piece of paper that we have. Because it's all turned out to have a policy, it's all turned out to have a, a right. simple list and a master plan of that. But if nobody's going to take it seriously, and nobody's going to actually put things into place and actually put a backbone to everything that's supposed to be in this little piece of paper, then shred it. I'm sorry to say, but that's all I've seen so far. They've written and written and written, and there's years of writing and writing and writing, but we're still right there. We haven't gone anywhere, we haven't done anything. Um, try to. <laughs> What's the next step after that? You shredded them. So, what? Then, therefore, there's a vacuum. Nature pours a vacuum. Mm-hmm. What is the next move? Um, in my opinion, I think that the okay, if you say shred them, I think that we need to come up with uh, a new way of looking at our tourism industry. It can be haphazard. I think that um, well, CY has done a lot of work on sustainable development and climate change and how it relates to tourism. I we realize that most of the businesses, the hotels, etc., they are mostly interested in their own work. They're not interested in how the environment impacts them. They're not interested in how they affect the environment. They are only centered around how much profit they can make. Um, as a result, I think that, well, it kind of ties into what my questions were supposed to be on the internet, but if you want to have a sustainable tourism sector, if it has to go beyond the effects of climate change and beyond the current um, environmental issues that we're facing now, I think we need to have a strategic plan that will guide us in the direction that we need to go, we need to go because, um, I think that, I don't think that there has been any real policy put in place 
um, for each or for the future generation <coughs> when it comes to tourism. And even though we have all of these resources, you know, they might not be there 20 years from now or 30 years from now. We really need to take that into consideration. So I think it needs to be much discussion on these issues and to find a, a strategic um, or feasible way forward, even as it involves expanding other sectors other than tourism, just making sure that we have um, a development plan in place for our young people.